You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here with Josh Hanf from the band Earth's Yellow Sun. Please check them out. They uh, put out an album called Infernal Machine, and they now have an animated comic book that they're putting on YouTube. Uh, They've almost put the last uh, part on called Rapture. So you could definitely have to watch them all in order and get the idea of the whole world of the universe of Earth's Yellow Sun. Josh, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me and welcome to The Pit. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for spreading the good word. I really appreciate it. I think the first question I have to start off with is, uh, what's your favorite video game? My favorite video game? Um, Recently, the one that uh, really got me going was the Final Fantasy VII remake. Um, I played the the original when I was a kid, and I knew that they were remastering it, and I just had to get it. so that one was pretty great for me. Uh, other than that, I play my fair share of uh, Mario Kart. Um, I'm not as much of a gamer as I used to be, um, although a bunch of my friends are. I know I'm missing out on uh, like Last of Us Part Two. I haven't touched, and Red Dead Redemption I haven't touched, and I know both of those I would love. Um, but life gets busy, so you know. Especially, especially when you're playing music as much as you are. Yeah, as much as I used to back when the world existed. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I kind of want to get to know your uh, superhero origin story. You're like, what, take me back before you were bitten by the radioactive spider or you sold your soul to the devil. You were just Josh and you're growing up around Toronto? Yeah, so I grew up in Thornhill, which is a suburb just north of Toronto. Um, after high school, I went to Carleton University in Ottawa, uh, and I went for math and economics, thinking that I was good at math in high school and I didn't know what else to do. And everyone around me was saying, you got to go to university. So I did without thinking twice. Um, And in my final year of that program, my third year, uh, I did a co-op placement in an office job that I absolutely hated. And that just really showed me that like that kind of life wasn't I'm not built for that. I needed to do something different. And I'd always loved music. Uh, and I played guitar since I was a kid, but I wasn't like a musician's musician. I didn't have a lot of formal education, didn't take music classes in high school. Um, so after I moved back to Toronto, I started working at Long McQuaid and eventually got into the more repair side instead of the retail side. And that kind of gave me some skills that I could use on my own. So I started my own business and meanwhile made plans to sort of eventually go, go back to school for music, which is what I really wanted to learn about because all the music that I loved, um, like classic prog rock and prog metal, uh, which was my universe at the time. Uh, I didn't really understand how any of it worked. And the only way to kind of figure it out to me, to my mind was I had to go immerse myself in the world of music. So uh, I did a couple other things. I'm kind of simplifying the story, but eventually I, I made my way to Humber College uh, into their uh, jazz performance program. And that was kind of uh, the beginning of my musical journey. Um, all the guys in Earth's Yellow Sun, we all met while we, while we were at Humber. Um, and we play, we play together quite a bit, or we used to play together back when we could do such things. And um, we play in a couple other contexts as well. But uh, yeah, Humber really gave me the knowledge and the confidence to kind of push off and try and make a career in the arts. So, but even before then, you said you played guitar since you were a uh, kid. What, what do you remember about being uh, wrapped up in playing guitar when you were a kid? Like what kind of music were you passionate about? And how, did, did you kind of gravitate towards heavier music and even more progressive music at a younger age? Sure. Um, I got turned on to the guitar one year when I went to summer camp, the only time I ever did this in my life, overnight camp rather. It was 1999. I was 12 years old and there were kids there with acoustic guitars and I didn't even like music that much at that point. Like I didn't know there wasn't like my dad listened to classical music. My mom listened to show tunes. So there wasn't like a lot of like rock happening in my house, but like somehow seeing these kids with their acoustic guitars or something, I was like, I have to do that. Like it was, it called me. So as soon as I got home, I asked my parents to like get me some lessons. Um, and I kind of started noodling around and 
I, at the same time, I was kind of getting into punk rock because like I was a kid growing up in the suburbs and, you know, you get like angry and angsty and start, you know, bands like uh, Bad Religion, No NoFX, uh, you know, classic punk bands on like labels like Epitaph. That was kind of my world until maybe the seventh grade or eighth grade when I got turned on to Metallica. Um, and then that was like my formative years as a guitar player when I started actually giving a shit about music um, and really get diving into it was like, yeah, Pantera was my alpha and my omega listening to Metallica, Slayer, Maiden, Sabbath. Like I really went back in time. There was something for some reason I really wanted to get into the history of the genre and kind of piece it together for myself. Um, and I have a lot of friends that kind of never went through that. And they're, they were always in like what was happening in the contemporary world, which, you know, I guess there's no reason to go either way, but teach their own. Um, but for me, I really wanted to like go back in time and sort of build my way up. So I'm, as influenced by bands like uh, Sabbath and, you know, Van Halen, rest in peace, um, as, you know, Dream Theater or Periphery and Meshuggah and all that stuff. Um, but it was definitely like the amount of time I spent learning uh, Metallica rhythm guitar parts and Lamb of God rhythm guitar parts, like that was probably a big formative thing for me in my younger days well i can definitely hear it in the playing too it's like with earth's yellow sun you guys got the riffs you got the rhythm it's got all the chug that i want well at the same time maintaining this very high intellectual instrumentation and all that so, so you're you're scratching both itches thanks man. that's what we try to do that's definitely what we try to do uh, so let's get into the formation of this. You guys met in college. Uh, you ran into Julian first and then met Duncan. Yeah, exactly. Um, Julian's our drummer. Duncan's our bass player. And uh, we started playing, I guess I was in first year. Uh, they were in second year at the time. Um, and we started jamming together. And uh, when you're in third year at Humber, you have your final recital. And then when you're in fourth year, you do your recording project when you go in the studio and you get to record an EP. Um, so we played on each other's final recitals. Um, we did some covers. We did like Tool and Scale the Summit and all kinds of random. I mean, you know, the stuff you, you might expect someone with our influences to play. Uh, some of it you can find on the Earth's Yellow Sun YouTube channel. Um, but... Yeah, so we did that in third year. And then when Julian was in fourth year for his recording project was the first EP that Earth Yellow Sun put out, Prologue, um, which was our first foray really into writing instrumental music that, like you said, kind of like tickled our itches for grooves and riffs. Um, but we tried to have melody and song structure without the use of, of a vocalist. Um, and that's why we called it prologue. It was kind of like a, an experiment to see if this concept would even work. And, uh, it was, it's kind of the story before the story. And then the next year was my recording project. Um, and that was when we recorded the infernal machine. That was 2015. It came out. So it was my, the school year was 2014, 15. Um, and I was also working in the studio at the time as an assistant engineer as like a part-time job. So because of that, I had a lot more access um, to be able to go in after hours, like late at night and, you know, go into one of the B rooms or the classroom and set up to record all kinds of like additional instrumentation. Um, so we could do all these like crazy overdubs. Like, so listening to the, the Infernal Machine album, like the scope of that for a Humber recording project was kind of insane. I had teachers telling me as much. Um, and I could only even submit the first three songs out of five when it was time to get it graded because they only expected like at most 15 minutes. And I had like this 22 minute epic that I put all this outside work into. And they're just like, you know, good for you. You're crazy, but we're not going to bother with that. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how it all happened through Humber. And then we just kind of tried to keep it going. Um, and since then, we've been fortunate enough to play like a lot of pretty sweet local shows with with bigger bands that come through town. 
Uh, we went on tour with Protest the Hero at one point, which was awesome. Um, and we're still good friends with those guys. Um, I work with them quite a bit as a guitar tech and Julian, our drummer, uh, he does the vast majority, if not all of the drum transcriptions for their uh, sheet music company, Sheet Happens. Um, so we have a working relationship with those guys, which is pretty sweet. Uh, and we've played, you know, bands like Intervals, Pliny, Thank You Scientist. Those guys are like some of our heroes because they're like kind of in the same, in a similar vibe as us, not the same, but doing the same like weird instrumentation experiments in prog music. Um, I forget what the question was, but <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Uh, I wanted to kind of ask you about the horns. Uh, did you, when you guys first started getting together, was it already like an idea? Like we let's do an horn section. Let's do something with horns. Yeah. So the idea to put saxophones in metal music had been with me for a long time, actually. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it, but I got the idea reading an interval, an interview, and I think Guitar World or, or Guitar One or something with Randall Smith, who started the company Mesa Boogie Amplifiers, and they make like some of the best heavy amps for the past 20, 30 years. Um, I personally own a Mark IV, and I absolutely love it. But uh, I remember Randall saying when he was designing the Mark I, his mission was to make guitar sound like saxophone. And that like really struck me. He was like trying to get the overtone series to give you that like crunch that you get with saxophone notes. And I'm like, well, you're making like the best amps for metal music that like all my favorite bands play. And you want a guitar to sound like saxophone. So why aren't there saxophones in heavy music? And that was just like the seed that was planted in me. And uh, when we started fooling around at Humber and I knew I didn't want to do a band with vocals, like to have a full-time vocalist. Um, instead of doing like a two guitar, I mean, we did have two guitars at one point, but instead of that, be always being like guitar melodies and just being like a guitar metal band. Um, and also because we were in jazz school, we were surrounded by super talented horn players. You know, I had that idea and, you know, opportunity when like in terms of like supply and demand, if like going into any of those classes, like the sax master class or the brass master class, um, and you say, Hey, you want to play some heavy music and take a break from bebop scales for a bit? Like, you know, so many sax players I had like jumping at the bit and we were really spoiled for choice when it came to uh, time to record. It must've been really satisfying just adding each, uh, voice slowly and then hearing this whole thing come together when you were mixing it. Yeah, it was super cool because, I mean, on Prologue, we had one tune where we experimented with the saxophone. We had a sax solo um, by my friend Savick. And then on The Infernal Machine, that was when I was like writing during the summer. And I really wanted to be like, all right, no, this isn't just like a feature part. This is going to be like, this is our melody machine is going to be like a horn section, a saxophone section. And uh you know, we didn't know how, exactly how it was going to come out. And exactly like you said, I remember the night we finished our, uh, I wouldn't say our final mix, but like our functional final mix for part five. And we listened to the whole thing front to back. And it was like, it came together, man. And I remember sitting in the studio with our engineer, Matt Grady, it was Emac Studios in London, Ontario. And we were all just like completely like, blown away at this thing that we'd all work together to build it was a really cool feeling and the story it's you made up the story right yeah i mean yeah sort of i i have to credit um my influences i guess in terms of like the stuff that i read and science fiction and um there's a blog called Wait But Why by this guy, Tim Urban, and he wrote a really interesting article about artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence a few years ago, even before we were making the record. And reading that was like really what pushed me to be like, this is super interesting and no one's thinking about it. And it just, you know, I grew up watching Terminator 2 and like stuff like that. I'm a huge science fiction nerd. So it that was just kind of a story I wanted to try and tell with instrumental music. And as we were writing it, um, me and my producer, Chris, who's now the keyboard player in the band, um, 
we were kind of like storyboarding this thing in our heads as we went. And every single riff had like, there was something going on in the story. So it was always like a thing that I wanted to do is like, okay, like we finished the record. It came out in 2015 and instantly I was like, we need to like make this visual companion piece um, to, to the album. And because it was like this storyboard thing in my head, it just made sense to do it as a comic book sort of vibe. Um, and I, I knew this like great artist named Dave Franciosa out of Hamilton, who we would worked with on merch stuff before. And uh, it just made sense. He was like super in love with the music and he was down to do it. And we just, you know, started plugging away and it took a long time. Like it's the, it was the five year anniversary of the release in August when we started putting this thing out. Um, but you know, shit costs money. So <laughs> we're an independent band. Okay. We can't just, you know, make it all happen overnight. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the summer of Prague tour that you guys went on and just, you know, how was that? <laughs> it looked like you, you posted some pictures on your Instagram and I can just imagine that would have been a lot of fun. Yeah, that was a good one. So that was the first time we experimented with like making our own tour and doing it all ourselves. And it was a lot of work. <laughs> it was a lot of work, but we played with some awesome, awesome bands. Um, and they were all like some bands that we played with before and uh, just had friends in. So uh, Pyramid Theorem, also from Toronto, and they've been doing this for, they've been, you know, grinding for a long time. And they just came out with their new album maybe a month ago. Um, let me just pull it up. I got to plug it because those guys are so awesome. And their their drummer was on the um, like the the drum competition held by the guy that did Metal a Headbanger's Journey. So if you go on their YouTube, uh, he came in second place. He should have won. He for sure should have won. <laughs> but whatever. So their new album is called Beyond, Beyond the Exosphere, and it was produced by Rich Chicky, who's done like Rush and you know every goddamn awesome <laughs> prog album that you could ask for. So it's amazing. I love those guys so much. So we played with them. Uh, my buddy's band Afterwake. Um, so the singer in Afterwake plays with us. Me, Duncan, and Julian do tribute bands. We do Tool, Rage Against the Machine, and Incubus. And the singer from Afterwake is the singer in our Incubus band. Um, so we had that mutual connection, and we all, we like we'd heard his music as he was working on it, as as that band was like putting it together, and they were ready to go on tour. So we were like, "Fuck it, let's do it." um play with the dead centuries out of ottawa and bird problems out of montreal and like i don't know if you know bird problems but those guys are killing hilarious hard. yeah so there was <laughs> yeah. a lot of talent on the stage when we played for sure um those were some exciting exciting nights uh so a tool cover band an incubus cover band and a rage against the machine cover band can i just uh, can i live your life like i would give <laughs> seriously just to be in one of those bands like uh, i love incubus and everybody's forgot about them yeah like, uh, and yeah it's a lot of fun when we got to, and we would do them all three in the same night and just like play all night long which is super fun because like playing ursiel san stuff you know playing your original music can't ask for much else but like we'd get to do like a 30, maybe 40 minute set, depending on the circumstances. Um, but when we do the tribute thing, we literally were on stage all night long, which is tiring, but you really get to stretch it, even though you're playing other people's music and, you know, getting, it's, a, it's easier to promote just, you know, the times we live in, it's a lot easier to get people out to come see, you know, cover tribute bands, whatever, than original music. Um, I wish it wasn't the case, but that's kind of, kind of the deal but you know it keeps us keeps us sharp keeps us playing and it, and we we are able to do some like cross promotion which is cool definitely um, yeah and it, you know the tribute stuff it's a blast I, I i can't say enough and like i have to give definitely have to give props to julian because the work he put in to learn all those tool drum parts like watching him grow as a drummer from when we were you know, jamming at the beginning of Humber and like first and second year and like hacking away at like, I think Lateralis was the first tool tune we learned for his final recital. And going from there to now, I mean, we know the better part of their discography at this point. He, the work he put in at learning all that stuff, like it's not easy for any of us, but holy shit. 
Well, you also got to uh, take some credit for yourself. I watched the uh, video of you playing uh, on Impulse, the Animals' as leader cover. Uh, you played the solo note for note. So uh, Man, I think was- all you guys deserve a lot of respect for the musicianship you bring to the table. I appreciate that, man. I mean, and Julian knows because that was in my final recital and that year we were living together. So he knows how much time I put in like practicing that shit every day. Um, And you can see as soon as I finish that solo, I have a fucking big goofy grin and I'm looking at my keyboard (laughs) player like, holy shit, we did it. And it was the last song of the of the whole thing. So it felt good to to play that and all the work that I put into it to to get it and, and get it out. You know, that was pretty satisfying. Uh, so choosing covers though, to do with earth's yellow sun with any band is, it's uh, kind of a hard process, isn't it? Deciding, you know, what you want to do, but the three that you guys chose on one of your last releases, the 2112, the mm-hmm. larger than life and, uh, entertain me, you guys just totally took those songs and made them your own. Like, was it hard to choose hard to Thanks, narrow man. down? Yes. The songs? yes, it was hard to choose. Um, That EP actually was Duncan's recording project because he took some time off between, I think, second and third year or third and fourth year. So his recording project was after mine. Um, And yeah, and we just didn't have enough time to write music. And we're just like, you know, fuck, let's just do covers, thinking that it would somehow be easier. But it probably wasn't looking back. Um, And we each kind of, between the three of us, I mean, it was like a group conversation to pick them, but each one of them ended up kind of being one of our babies. Um, Entertain Me was Julian's. I mean, we all love Tigran for sure. I got to see Tigran live in Israel. I think last time I was there, maybe the time before. And man, what a talent. <laughs> like to do what that guy can do on piano and like the rhythmic grid that he has in his mind, how sharp it is, like just doing it by himself on piano. And then obviously with, with his band, with the drummer, uh, who I can't, Arthur Natak, I think is his name. Um, you know, it's unbelievable. It's like Mashuga, but piano jazz. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So exactly like Julian, it. you know, I think it was his idea to pick that one. And I'm pretty sure he did most, if not all of the arrangement of it. Um, I might've tweaked some of the horn parts a little bit, but we kept that one pretty close to the original because like there's so much going on in those three and a half minutes ish that like there wasn't a lot we wanted to put on top and just like learning those parts. Oh man, that was hard. That was like mind bendingly hard. And I had jammed with sugar tunes in the past with a buddy of mine. Um, and we'd played, you know, like animals as leaders or whatever, but this was like, we were doing math. Like this yeah. is calculus. It was really hard and to get that stuff together. And I'm yeah. really proud how it turned out. Um, Larger than life. The Backstreet Boys cover we did was Duncan's baby. Um, he's hugely into pop music. So is Julian. Um, and they, they really wanted to do that tune. And we were obviously needing a vocalist. Um, and so we picked Lauren from red handed denial, who we've played with a bunch of times um, they were on tour with Protest with us, with Protest the Hero, and we've done some one-off shows with them. Uh, we're good buds with those guys, and they're just so good. They've got a bunch of great albums out. Um, so when we were thinking about doing this pop tune, it really made sense to get Lauren, both for her, like, you know, star power, her YouTube following, and her talent. Like, man, she killed it so hard. And working with her, like, in the studio when it was time to record her parts, like, she came in knocked out the parts and it was like, all right, well, like, can we do some harmonies? And it was like, fuck yeah, let's do it. And she like, without us like telling her what to do, she was just like knocking out three part harmonies, no problem. And it was, man, she is a pro. She's a pro among pros. She does not deserve, or she does not get as much recognition as she deserves because man, she's so talented and she's such a great person to be around. Um, And then, yeah, like the third one that you said, was uh that was my baby because obviously i'm i'm the more old school prog and metal fan um and 2112 is one of my favorite albums ever definitely my favorite rush album and i remember the first time i heard the overture was in a skate video i think it was jamie thomas of zero skateboards and i want to say it was a dying to live video he used it for his part and man, it was so cool. And like, that was the first time I heard that tune. 
and uh, I always wanted to cover it. And I knew it was so far afield from our normal sound in what we were doing in like the quote unquote modern prog. Um, so we had to, it took a lot of tweaking to get it to a place that was like, this kind of sounds like it could be Earth's Yellow Sun. Um, but at the same time, I didn't give a shit. I was just like so obsessed with the idea of like doing that song and making it our own. Um, and like I said before, because we had this working relationship with Protest the Hero, um, we were able to reach out and very lucky for Rody Walker to agree to do it. And, you know, the results speak for themselves. Like, holy shit, he, he kills Getty's parts. So, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't be more happy with how that turned out. And do you think there's any chance that you guys might do more covers in the future? Or is it kind absolutely. of something? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Never say no. And uh, I don't think uh, we'd ever have a singer in the band, but I'm always down and we're always down to work with more guest singers and uh, experiment with different, uh, different voices. Cause I think that's super fun and it gives us, it keeps it fresh for us too to have like a different vibe for different songs. And uh, the cover thing is a really cool way to do that in like a, a one-off sort of format where we're not committing to it for like an album or something. Um, yeah. So we definitely aren't ruling that out. Right now, we've been working on some new original material because obviously it's been five years since our last original EP came out. So that's been the focus lately. Um, and hopefully we'll be putting stuff into into Pro Tools over the winter time. But um, after that happens, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if more covers happen and uh, more varied experimentation in terms of like who we're working with. Uh, so I'm sure you don't want to give away too much about the new material that you guys are working on, but, uh, is it, do you think it's going to be another concept? Um, it's not going to be a, a concept in the same sense as the infernal machine where it was like a story, but there is going to be a theme that ties the album together. Um, I don't want to spoil it yet, but, uh, yeah, we're just kind of reacting to the world around us and you know we're writing instrumental music so there's only so much of a message we can pop in there but uh yeah there's going to be a, a little bit of a central theme to it i think i i wanted to go back to what you were saying before about not having a singer in the band because i think that's a really wise decision for you guys because a, a singer really encapsulates a lot of the emotion and the feeling behind the music. Just, it just does. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you have a whole new singer bringing it into the studio, it's like you have a whole new universe with the same band. Absolutely. And for me growing up as a metalhead, like I love Rush. I love Megadeth. I love Lamb of God. I love Devin Townsend. And I can show any of those bands to other people. And for everyone that's like, this is sick, there's going to be someone that's like, I can't deal with this singer. And that's happened to yeah. me so many times where someone's just like, I don't like the vocals. I can't listen to this. And I was like, it's like vocals are such like a weird polarizing personal thing. Yeah. And I didn't want to commit to having, to commit to a vocalist that would, you know, be the image and the voice of our band. Like that's, I think it's a lot to ask of somebody. And also I didn't have that person in my life to tap into. And moreover, as much as I love those singers that I mentioned, like Randy Blythe and, and Devin, when I listen to their music, I love the intensity they bring, but the lyrics and like, it's not the most important thing in the music for me. Like you said, like groove and riffs is like my, my world. Right. So I wanted to stick to what I know and like writing grooves and riffs. And instead of trying to find some magical singer front person, that would just be like the perfect fit that we could commit to for the career of our band. I, it was, it's just more in my wheelhouse and all of our wheelhouse, like having gone to music school, learning about harmony, learning about melody writing in terms of j a jazz context, like it's just, 
more it's more inside us i think um and having having three sa- or two saxophone players now in the band to like bounce melodies off of i mean those though i i think it's as much like a, a thing of like that's the opportunities we had those are the people that we had access to um if i had a, a devon a young devon townsend around me you know or see son might have vocals in it but we didn't so this is I, I- that's part of history. And also I think you guys shouldn't uh, question it as well as things have come together uh, as, as fluidly as they could. And I think maybe that's just for a different project. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And like we, like I said, man, we're stoked to work with vocalists and do like little one-off tunes. Like we can still scratch that itch when we want to, but it's a big commitment to like have a singer and like rely on them to front your band. And like all of a sudden, when you're an instrumental band, no one's really like the single person that you're identifying as like, they have to carry the image of the band. But as soon as there's a vocalist, like they not only need to be like on point every night that you play as a a singer, it's like, you're relying on them to like have a certain image and carry themselves a certain way on the internet. And, you know, it's, it's a lot to ask of somebody. And like I said, it, it wasn't our wheelhouse anyways. So, I, I was a lot more interested in writing instrumentally and having gone to, um, gone to, to jazz school and having played improvisational music with so many people and, and getting trained in it. Um, we were a lot more interested in pushing that end of the envelope than doing a sort of stock metal song form as good as we might be able to do it um my the things that i look for in music is like it's like a a scientific experiment for me like what ingredients can i combine and see what happens and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't you know we're gonna have people that think like if you look at the comments sections of some of those cover videos you'll see some uh some negative comments just along those positive ones and like, that's fine. Like teach their own. Um, so I would rather approach music that way. just like, it's a, it's a lab to, to try different things. And especially being like this weird niche instrumental band, like we're not doing this for anybody except for ourselves. So there's no reason to try and like fit into any box. We might as well just do what seems fun and interesting and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. When you uh, uh, describe music as being an uh, experiment, it makes me really start to think that maybe all you guys are actually just grown in a petri dish in a lab. That's why you're all <laughs> such good musicians. <laughs> maybe, uh, who knows? Maybe that'll be the next interview. We'll uh, <laughs> break the news. So uh, what do you see on the horizon, not just for Earth's Yellow Sun, but for yourself? So... For Earth's Yellow Sun, we're just looking at trying to get this album, finish writing it. It's it's definitely we're in the, the final stages of the writing process, but then starting to record it and find the money to <laughs> to do the whole thing. Um and apart from that, man, we're just waiting for the stupid pandemic to figure itself out because the whole the whole world's on hold. And uh, it's definitely been hard for all of us. Um you know, if you talked to me in February of this year and you asked me what I did for a living, I would have told you I was a musician. Uh, now I'm not so sure. Um, it's so we're all just trying to stay busy in our own right and like be able to make a living. Cause we were all trying to build up this career with music and, uh, both in terms of our original band and the tribute bands and, you know, the other guys do other stuff too, like musical theater shows and stuff like that on the side, all kinds of stuff. So we'd all been like in the process of like, you know, we hadn't made it by any stretch. We still had some sort of outside jobs, but we had a balance going on. Right. And, you know, mid March of this year, it all just disappeared. So we've just been kind of trying to keep, uh, keep our heads together, keep, keep some income coming in so we can survive. Um, Myself, like I said before, uh, I fix guitars and basses out of my apartment. So that's like my own business that I run. 
But apart from that, um, I'm a member of the Canadian Naval Reserves as a musician. And that has been something I've been doing since summer of 2018. So it's been just over two years now. Um, and it's been a great job. And not only that, I've actually got Duncan, our bassist, and Brian, our tenor sax player. They both joined my unit. So those guys are both enlisted as well at HMCS York along with me. Um, so that's been a great lifeline for us because we've been able to keep busy with the military um, through the summer and uh, continuing into the fall, which has really helped keep uh, keep some money coming in um, because we've been we've definitely been taken care of on that front. Um, and then as far as I'm looking forwards in my life, like I don't know when anything's going to be returning to any kind of normal, if it's going to return to any kind of normal, like when are we going to be able to play the tribute gigs that we were making good money doing before, you know, packing venues. I don't know. So I'm looking at kind of, instead of trying to rebuild the musical career I had for, you know, whatever level it was, I would, I'm no, no Eddie Van Halen, but um, I, I'm looking to make some lateral moves and, and do some stuff in the Navy, in the military. That's not just working as a musician, but doing some more uh, hands-on hard sea stuff. So my last couple months, I've been really focused uh, on, you know, working out and, and getting more in shape and getting stronger uh, to kind of prepare myself for, for some really demanding, uh, physically and mentally demanding trades that I that I want to get into. Um, and that's been something the whole band has been doing, like especially me, Julian and Duncan uh, and Brian too, I would say we've been like, we have a group chat and every day we're like, Oh, like I did this run. I did whatever. Um, just to keep sane. Um, because in, in, in a time when everyone's mental health is like a roller coaster, I find the best thing that I can do to keep myself sane when I'm like stuck alone uh, not living alone. I live with my girlfriend, but you know, apart from my bandmates and, and some of my best friends, um, just staying active and keep pushing my body um, and having that goal in mind to, to do stuff within the military uh, really gives me reason to like, keep, keep working at it and keep pushing myself. It's not just for like, you know, aesthetics or long-term health. It's like, no, like this is the next adventure I want to go on in my life. Um, and looking back, the Infernal Machine, when I wrote it in the summer of 2014, summer and fall, like early in that summer was the first time that I went overseas to Israel and I spent almost a month there. And so much of like my brainstorming and thinking about what that album was going to be happened while I was like thousands of miles away, didn't have a guitar, didn't have, wasn't making music. I was just like doing something totally new and going on some adventure and like having new life experiences. Um, and, and that really, I think informed a lot of, if there is originality and, and uniqueness and creativity going on on that EP, I think I, I, a lot of it is owed to that time I took, uh, when I was overseas. So as we're like writing this new record and we've been kind of doing this grind as musicians for the better part of a decade now, um, I think it's time to go on like a new adventure and have some non-musical experiences that can kind of inform the artistry moving forwards. I think that's really healthy to have that balance as I, a lot of musicians, will, we get into this, this habit of just, you know, going into the woodshed and locking ourselves in there and practicing for nine hours a day. And we forget to just, you know, go outside, see the sun, go for a jog, go for a hike, like get your blood pumping. It's going to make your mood feel better. It's going to just make a lot of things better. Right. If you just stay active. Absolutely, man. And like so many, like art is only as interesting as the artists that make it. And I've heard a lot of stand up comedians talk about like, you know, you spend like the better part of your young adult life, like working up the material that goes into like your, your breakout routine, your first special, whatever, the thing that makes you famous. And then you're touring the thing for like however long, and then it's time to make your second special. And like you spent your life just like going on tour, taking planes to different cities, 
you know, go, being in different hotels. And then your yeah. second special is just about like plane travel and stuff and like, you know, <laughs> being on a bus or whatever. I don't remember if it was like Seinfeld. It might've been Joe Rogan talking about that, but you know, you got to like live life to have something worth saying. Yeah, absolutely. And and you can't just lock yourself off and be like, I'm going to go write some awesome magnum opus completely in a vacuum. It's, yeah. it's probably going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe some people can do it. I don't think I'm that person. I know for me, it's, it's time to like, like I've been, we've been grinding at, the, at this thing for like, yeah, like a decade now. We started at Humber. I started at Humber in 2011. Um, and yeah, watching everything fall apart from coronavirus is like, okay, everything's just kind of fucked. I'm going to like take some time and do something that is available to me right now and work on that instead of like feeling sorry for myself that like this whole thing is kind of falling apart. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just figuring out what you can do (laughs) for yourself to keep things going. Uh, I wanted to ask you just what advice would you give to anyone who's just trying to pursue their dreams? Um, Process is everything. If you, you need to love the doing part of whatever your dream is. Don't pursue your dream because of like what you think the result will be or what the result will get you. You need to love the act of making or do it, like whether it's making music, making movies, you know, starting a business, like don't do anything because of what you think is at the finish line. Do it because the thing that is the race or whatever metaphor you want to use for the work itself, like you got to love the work itself because that's where you're going to be spending 95% of your life. Is there anything else you wanted to say to our listeners? Man, thank you for having me on. And uh, thanks. Yeah, I really appreciate it. If your listeners want to check us out, we're on Bandcamp. We're on all the streaming platforms. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook, Instagram, give us a shout, give us a message, you know, whatever, you know, we appreciate any kind of fan feedback or comments or whatever, you know, engage with us and we'd be happy to hear from you. Awesome. Everyone, this is Josh Hanth from Earth's Yellow Sun. Thank you for listening to The Peach Pit. And Josh, thanks for taking time to talk to me. Hopefully we'll do it again someday. Dude, no worries. Thanks for having me on.